c'est un plaisir d'être ici encore. <rire> un grand merci euh, à Sophie, uh -oh. uh, Sophie et Aurélien et les autres. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back. Uh, I had a wonderful time here in 2019. And uh, despite the uh, delays of COVID, uh, we've made a lot of progress in uh, digital work with music. And what I'd like to share with you is a, a journey that I've been under, uh, undertaking for the last 10 years or more, uh, in part because of juxtapositions and encounters and intersections with colleagues here and around the world. And if uh, any of you are interested, you can follow uh, look at these slides again later yourself. So a quick view of where we're going to go, uh, what musicologists used to do, I'll say. Uh, music and number, music as an art of combinations, encoding music, data structures, the mechanical ear, and then maybe quantitative methods and qualitative interpretation. So what did we used to do? Well, uh, uh, years ago, I still do this, but we were interested in manuscripts and printed sources uh, visual representations, cultural work that results in monographs and articles. Uh, I wrote a book about uh, Lasso, who was arguably kind of the Mozart of the 16th century, uh, another cultural history of music in the Renaissance. Uh, and well, uh, then a series of juxtapositions emerged from two very, very different institutions. I teach at Haverford College, which is just outside of Philadelphia. And it is a, we've been seeing these kind of cosmological views of ourselves and feeling increasingly small uh, in uh, those views. And Haverford epitomizes that. Uh, you know, we're one of over 5,000 institutions of post-secondary education in the United States. Just to give you an idea of the scale of education in the United States. And it is an entire zoo of institutions. And Haverford is a very strange creature in this zoo. It's a liberal arts college, tiny. Only undergraduates, 1,300 students, 120 faculty members. That's it, right? Um, it is a speck. You could take all of the leading liberal arts colleges in the United States, their faculty, their students, and they would easily fit within the football stadium at Ohio State University, right? That's how small we are in this universe. And weirdly, uh, we're connected, as founded by the Quakers. Most of these liberal arts colleges were created by various Protestant groups in the United States and are often far-flung places. Haverford just happens to be outside uh, Philadelphia. But we found an interesting intersection, thanks to my colleague Philip von Rieks, whom I've known for many decades, at the CUSR, the Center for Advanced Study of the Renaissance in Tours, which is it's also its own quirk in the world of higher education, being a graduate faculty and research center devoted only to advanced studies, publication projects, colloquia and collaboration in all disciplines, uh, but in particular, musicology is a strong suit of theirs. And so we come together uh, in a number of different projects, one uh, that actually involved the republication of a set of music books that are preserved partly in Nantes and partly here in the library in Orléans, was a set of republications with digital editions of um, French songs from the mid 16th century that when we got to nearly the end of this project, we bumped into the obvious fact that uh, about a third of the music was incomplete because the books were issued as separate parts and two of the voices were lost. So a third of the repertory was missing. And so Philippe and I launched this idea of reconstructing the missing pieces by building an annotated database of what happens in the extant pieces. So we had a control and we had expert knowledge and then we used graduate students to make a database of 11,000 events that took place, little micro moves in the music. And we used those to inform uh, humans, musicologists, music students, in reconstructing those and making dynamic additions. This then led, and it's a kind of a story of moving goalposts, we might say. Each attempt to do something was a reach into an unknown, as we talked about earlier uh, this week. And each one then resulted in a series of new ideas. The current project is called the Citations Project, and it's about a genre in the 16th century that was wholly founded on the idea of reworking pre-existing music. It's kind of like rap or hip hop is today. The whole idea is that you borrow from something that was before, and don't just repeat it, but you transform it. And so it's about this idea not of identity in music, but of similarity. What are the transformations to which music has been subjected? 
And we use some of the same techniques, building an analytic database, data analysis tools now, conferences. We just had a little conference and tour last week with my partners, uh, major grants from the ACLS and the Mellon Foundation. These are private institutions in the United States. And the project in, in French comes out, it's CRIM, and the French here call it CRIM. So uh, all of the participants have been criminel, and the criminel is now a wide network. In fact, just before a previous gathering in 2019, our server was cannibalized by Russian hackers to mine Bitcoin. And we decided that this was a sort of a, they knew about this other group of criminals, and so they decided they were gonna take us down, I think is what it was. We are well protected at this point. It's a, a large um, group of very international people here in tour, uh, in Canada, in the US, uh, technical partners all over the world, Melbourne. Um, many undergraduate students have participated in this work uh, and done a lot of the computer programming. My student Ola Shostak from Ukraine is a, is a computer science student. He was with me here last week. Uh, two students from Bryn Mawr College, which is a sibling institution of mine, are from Vietnam. Uh, is truly a global enterprise and also interdisciplinary in the sense that we bring together data science students, um, people in musicology, uh, and also across generations. And I think that's another important frontier. I learn as much from my students as I teach them. Uh, institutions and agencies. We would be nowhere in one of these presentations if we didn't have logos. And I think it's important to have both logos and acronyms. I'll just say as a footnote, I think another opportunity here in France for growth would be to hire the medievalists that we have to make both acronyms and acrostics out of the acronyms that we have, which would make a very interesting project, I think, in its own way. But Haverford, uh, Le Studium, the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities, Melbourne University, and the many grant agencies that I've just mentioned. Well, music and number. Go back to the sixth century and the Roman statesman Boethius said that music is number in sound. And this is the governing uh, understanding of the place of music in intellectual space. So music as a speculative mathematical art. And here's a famous set of images from a er late 15th century music theory book with a series of the mythical founders of music, Eubal from the Bible, Pythagoras, and several other of kind of Pythagoras and his friends. And you notice they're all involved in kind of measuring. Every one of these instruments has numbers around it. Musical instruments might be called sound measuring devices in this period. Um, here we have a very early PowerPoint. Um, you can see uh, Wisdom here on the left with her stick. And she's pointing at a series of spaces for music that go from real music, musica instrumentalis, that's the stuff that we actually hear and use, musica humanus, which is the music that is or is in us, to be alive is to be ensouled, and for the body to be in the soul is a kind of harmony. This was ancient teaching. And then finally we have musica mundana, and you can see there's another one of our space shots there with earth, water, and stars, and the heavenly orbits. And this is the music of the spheres that connects music with number and speculative uh, science. Uh, here's music among the liberal arts. And you can see a whole map of knowledge here with uh, philosophia at the center. And then you have an array of the disciplines. There's uh, Plato and Socrates are there in the middle. And we have the old poets. And then we have a series of images around the outside. Of On the left, uh, we have uh, top left, we have astronomy over there at the top left at about 11 o'clock. And then geometry and arithmetic. And then music down here at the bottom where the arrow is. And then we have dialectic, uh, rhetoric, and uh, grammar. And this is the famous trivium and quadrivium. And what's very interesting, I had to do this, by the way. Just can't resist. There. We could spin it around. And if we spun musica up to the top, what's very interesting about musica is that musica is right in between dialectic on one hand and arithmetic on the other. It's right at the, it, one of the, it's at the intersection of the trivium and the quadrivium. And in some ways, you could write the history of music, especially in the period of the 16th century, as being a moment where music slides from being understood in the kind of intellectual space, from being part of the quadrivium of mathematics and geometry and the arts of number, 
and moves into the arts of language. It's used as something that is persuasive, that is expressive. And this is a large part of what music winds up doing in the 16th century, but it constantly is pulled back and forth. There were conservative forces that wanted music to be about number, uh, that realized it couldn't be. And so you have a whole series of now increasingly empirical experiments that realize that, well, yeah, number and ratio explain musical harmony, but you can also create music and harmony through other means. And it's the realization that music is partly number and partly experience. Um, that is an important motivating force in this and, and recognizing the place of music in things. So now let's move on to the music as the art of combinations. And I'd like to start with um, these six measures. If you study these six measures, you'll know everything you need to know about Renaissance music. And let's listen to them here. Actually, the chanson is by a guy named Pierre Sandrin, who was a court musician to Francis I. And uh, the poem, in fact, is attributed to King Francois I. So this could well have been a piece heard over at Chambord in the few times they were actually there. So let's listen to it. This is the ensemble Douze Memoir, which is named for this piece. And we'll just listen to the six opening measures. And then I'll go back and unpack them. Whoop, didn't play. Let's go back. <laughs> If you know those six measures, you'll know all you need to know about Renaissance music. You take, this is polyphonic music, so we have four independent lines. And one move is, one combination is you take two lines and they move in parallel with each other. Yum, bum, 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 bum is one line. And then you move that in parallel with itself. And then meanwhile, you accompany one or the other of those lines with a motion that goes yum, bum, bum, bum. Fa, do, re, la. And if you put those two together, you get a move. It's, it's a, called a Romanesca is what it's called. It's, it's like the blues progression of the 16th century. It is a foundational piece of work. It's behind every tune that you know. Greensleeves works this way. And so if a musician sees a melody that moves in those conjunct steps, you know immediately that you can do this with another voice and that you will make nice sounds with it. Uh, now here's the next move. Um, re, fa, sol, la. Again, this is, don't know what else to do in Renaissance music? Do that little melodica idea. Because what you can do with it is you can immediately combine it with itself. Ya, da, da, da. You can go down an octave. Oh, da, da, da. And ya, da, da, da. Ya, da, da, da. You can go up a fifth. So you can compose, you can set it below itself, right, from the top one to the bottom, and then above that by a different interval. And this is called invertible counterpoint. It's the kind of thing that was taught to eight-year-olds in choir schools of the sort we see over here at Orléans. Weirdly, in today's curriculum, it's reserved for fourth-year music students, as if it's some kind of great secret. In fact, there are a whole series of little formulas that in just looking at a melody like that, you can immediately tell what you can do with it. So it's like a little self-reproducing means. I was thinking about some of the chemical interlocks that we've been seeing lately, and that's very much like it. And then the last move is this little cadence. Yum, ba, dum, is the top voice. Ya, da, dum, and ya, da, da. And the lower voice goes, ya, da, da is one voice and the top voice goes ya da da and the two of those together make first of all a moment of tension and dissonance and then a moment of release and conclusion. And so if you put all of those things together, we might as well go back and listen to it one more time, you get a comprehensible musical utterance. This is a little sentence that goes by first of all combining one melody with another and then goes by combining these little schemata one to the next to make the right ordering of events to say something. And then we go on to 
the next idea. So we have a full set of those things. So then if we understand music as an art of combinations, we can understand the art of borrowing as the art of recombination. Because that's what these guys are doing. They're not just citing a pre-existent piece. They are taking it apart and putting it back together in a new way. You can kind of imagine this as a, we have Legoland not too far from here. It's a kind of a Lego game. You can immediately see different ways of recombining the material. And so this entire genre is called the imitation mass in which a composer would take a pre-existing work, could be a French chanson of the sort we have. And in fact, this piece figures the model that we just saw figures in our project. Could be a chanson, an Italian madrigal, a Latin motet. These are sacred pieces. These are secular pieces. These are very secular pieces sometimes. And their music is transposed in the con into the context of the five fixed movements of the Christian mass. The, or the Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, Sanctus, and Agnus Dei that are part of the commemoration of the mass. These are generic texts that remain the same every time the mass is observed, but now given a particular marker by having these old sounds reinscribed in the new music. And it goes both ways. Controversy in the 16th century about how you could degrade the mass text by associating it with a love song, and simultaneously those who would argue that you would elevate what seemed to be profane love through the language of sacred devotion. So it works in both possible directions. You could think of this like the way that R&B is to gospel, if I can use an American analogy here, right? Um, the love is the same, the figure to which it's directed might be a little bit different. So it's all about recombination and even people in the Renaissance recognized that the art was not just in quoting, but was in transforming what was quoted and moving it around in different ways. Example, here by um, composer Josquin de Pré, who is arguably another uh, great of the Renaissance, and his colleague Antoine de Fevin. And we actually know that both of these guys were in Blois, not too far from here, in about 1501. So these were also, uh, Josquin visited the royal court. Fevin was definitely a royal court composer. And just to show you the kind of transformation that takes place, we're going to listen to the beginning of Josquin's motet in which another one of these kind of recombinant uh, projects unfolds in which a series of the same motive, the same melody, is reheard systematically at exactly the same time interval, and in this case, an octave below itself or at its own unison. So this is a really strict pattern is what this is. We call it a periodic entry, and here is a, a machine performance of this. just the selected notes from that passage. And another one of these unfolds right at the end of it. So you sort of move from what we call these points of imitation. And as you move from one to the next, you get this fabric of continuous unfolding. And here is what Fevin did with the same melody. So as ya da 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 is the tune, he takes the same melody and he discovered a way to combine it with itself at different time intervals, some shorter, some longer, but also both the love and below and above itself. So he found invertible counterpoint in this as well. It's sort of like he's going to outdo Josquin. tentative kind of cadence at the end, but he makes six or seven entries out of what had been four in an art of recombination along the way. So these fall into a series of, and I was struck by many of the talks on chemistry here, I begin to start, we used to call these schemata, I might begin to call these kind of topologies of how the counterpoint would work together. In the Renaissance, they provided entire manuals of these. There's one of hundreds of pages of commonplaces in which this writer says, just take these and use them in your own piece, right? It's like pre-made speeches is what they are. So go get them and do them. And then if you transcribe a lot of these, it turns out that they fall into very specific types, which a colleague of mine at McGill, Peter Schubert, has 
categorized into things that we call periodic entries. We saw one. Imitative duos is like a Bach fugue where you get a pair of these entries and then you wait a little while and you get another pair of them. So they work in very particular ways. And then a thing called fuga where it's freely recombined. And the point is that in each one of these constellations of different time intervals of let's say the same melody, you get different intersections between them and therefore different harmonies. In this world you have to understand chords or harmonies as the byproduct of intersecting lines and not as, you know, here's a melody and then I'm just going to play the chords to this melody. They didn't think that way. They thought yes of harmony, but harmony was the product of intersecting lines. And so these little modules now wind up repeating and become a form building element. Now we won't talk about the last category, it gets too complex, but we built a thesaurus, hundreds of pages of examples of these that then become the basis of an entire um, assembly line. We edit pieces digitally, we present them on the web, analysts use a agreed upon vocabulary to tag them in various contexts, produce descriptions of their transformations and commentary about them. And now in the most recent iteration, we use data analysis to uh, machine prospect for these and help us find them and aggregate patterns and talk about similarity on a much larger scale. Now I'm mindful of the time, so I'm gonna keep moving here. But one of the things we need to do is to encode pieces and transcribe them, symbolic scores, that's what an original one looks like. This is what we've done for decades, making modern editions of them. Sometimes we add editorial accidentals, that's not a fly spec, that's a little sharp that was unwritten in the original, but you need to know to sing, everyone did in the period. We write it out. Now we have logical as well as symbolic encodings. We use XML technologies to encode music in a way that we can say not only does it look like that, but it is an A, or it does have duration X. And this allows us now to compute upon these scores because we can address every note in them, we can count the notes, we can find distances between notes, and we don't just have a, a symbolic score, which is a set of instructions, but we have a durable and sustainable edition that we can do many things with, including accidentals that are now encoded, so we know who is responsible for which intervention. We can have critical editions like this, and in fact, dynamic texts that allow us to turn on and off different versions of a piece at will and allow readers to become editors of musical texts. And this allows a kind of consumption of music in a dynamic environment that really has never been possible before. And we can also cite these because every note in these XML encodings has, as it were, a GPS address, it has a unique identifier for every note in the piece. And so we can cite scores at the note level, not just on that page in those measures, but we can say that note. And that note relative to this note is what vector, right? So this is a transformation again because it's a quotable digital text. And then we can do things with it. We can compute upon them, we can present them in the screen, we can play them as we were just seeing here before. Well, I wanna move quickly through this. We also had to learn about data structures, um, how we would attach, make, create digital objects. There is a piece, uh, there is an observation, there is a person, and we have to model the data and all the facets that are around that data to make this work. After all, we don't wanna just have information about music, but we want to trace intellectual responsibility for the assertions that we make about this. And I would say if there's a big challenge in the humanities, and I think it's also in the sciences, particularly in an age of fake news, it's not about intellectual property and not repeating something that isn't yours, but it's about intellectual responsibility, which is not repeating something that you don't know to be true. Right? And moreover, taking not only credit, but blame for the things that you publish. And so what we want to do is to attach to every one of these little micro observations a blame, who said it? And I think this is an important thing for credit and credibility as we think about digital and collective endeavors, particularly in the humanities. So we encode these, we present them uh, for humans to consume, we present them in JavaScript object notation in a way that now machines can consume and navigate. We form these now as uh, larger kinds of, uh, of concepts, and my colleague Emilio Sanfilippo, who can't be here today because of COVID, if we had had the vaccine, he would have been here. Um, uh, not the vaccine, but the nasal vaccine, perhaps. He's helping us to think about uh, an ontology and to 
place these claims as well as the additions and the annotations in a semantic web space, linked open data. We were talking about open science before. Now that this allows the people and the claims to be exposed in a way that are durable, uh, reproducible, sustainable, and attributable. You could search them. Um, so there we are, sustainable, discoverable, attributable, and I think this is a pathway to new models of scholarly author authority. Um, I have five minutes or five so? Five minutes. Okay, good, I can do it. So uh, training the mechanical ear, this is the next thing that we're up to where we're using these encoded scores and this is in some ways thanks to COVID. COVID's been horrible, but the 18 months of delay in this project meant that the technical team, among others, have made some amazing progress in using Python, in particular Pandas, which is an amazing library for data analysis, um, a high performance data analysis of texts as well as of numbers. Having converted the music into a numerical form, we can use this to trace patterns, and there's our opening melody, which now is presented as a series of columns in a data frame, um, in which we can look at these as kind of vectors. We can now trace the melody as a series of numbers. You can already see how in this data frame, the four, one, two, two, minus three, which to a musician means something, those are the intervals between notes, not the notes themselves, is now you can see because of the distances between four and 20, and 20 and 36, and 36 and 52, that each of those entries is equidistant, right? There's a distance of 16. So now we can start to compute these patterns. We can compute vertical patterns as well. And to a musician, again, the fact that one of these is 5, 3, 1, 1, and another is 12, 10, 8, 8 is significant because one, they're in the same octave, and the other one, they're in two separate octaves, compound and simple. And this is an easy computation to transfer between the two. So now we can see where little modules repeat. And we can do this on a vast scale. We can apply distance measures, edit distances. Here is Levenstein distances, which are used in the calculation of uh, textual strings to calculate uh, and measure differences between melodies across a piece. So here, the dark bands indicate that recurring melody right at the outset of the composition and others. Um, we have a mechanical ear that can find that. Right? Uh, it can find these and we developed an algorithm that basically thinks through those rules and on the basis of having found melodies can categorize them. It does an amazing job of corresponding and confirming what our human observations have made about this. So here is a data frame that tells us about the recurring melody. And in fact, there is the observation. And here this P8, P1, P minus eight indicates the distances between the first note of one melody and the first note of the next melody. So it knows where they, it knows which melodies are the same. It knows where they occur in time and it knows where they occur in musical space. And this then permits us to find as it were a melody of melodies and to start to do this, which is now a network of melodies in, in, of melodic presentations. So it's not the tunes, but rather the spaces between the tunes that it's found. And this is a map of one of those complexes of a single work and its five derivatives showing you which movements actually do the same things with related or unrelated melodies. Um, here is a vectorization of the cadences. We talked about cadences before. Here's one piece and it's sort of a, a random walk around the piece. But the most important thing here is what happens, if I can point at this, I'm not sure, the one where two arrows come together because it tells us that that cadence is a special point of arrival since we go to it twice in the piece. And here is a map of all six related pieces in which the same centrum emerges. And this is done again with pandas and Python and um, network, com community network uh, things. So it's measuring um, high dimensional space. It's four dimensions of a cadence simultaneously. Um, this is now measuring cadences relative to which beat in the measure they appear on. And what this tells us is the irregular cadences only appear on weak beats of the bar, which is exactly what an expert would have told you, but we couldn't prove it until we went to that level. And then uh, we're also using tool criticism by thinking about false positives and false negatives. And this all brings me to uh, another of opportunities and challenges, and I am drawing to a close uh, here, is one is the resonance between research and teaching. I'm going to bring this into the classroom. Uh, students are at Haverford College are far too intelligent normally to take classes with me, but having offered this class, it is instantly full. 
with all the students who are interested in data science, but also who play the violin in our orchestra. And I know that they are going to leave me in the lurch in, within the first week. And I am perfectly happy to be outdone by them in many, many ways. And I eagerly await what they will do with this information and many other things. And this has been an important dimension of my own work. Uh, working as I do at this tiny college, uh, I am deeply indebted to my students for what they do. And these are big takeaways. Um, new modes of reading and writing, new modes of publication and scholarly communities, new, dis dinner, uh, new disciplinary intersections, music theory and music history, which have often kind of gone like this. But now, in addition to my colleagues in history and art history and literary history, I found a lot of interesting uh, uh, stimulation through data science and information science. And I am going to stop there. Great. Thanks very much.